Yeah, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David, a mortgage broker and founder of Atelier Wealth, where we help property investors start out and scale up their property portfolios. And quite often, we work with people who I call a frustrated investor, which is they're ambitious, but sometimes they're just hitting a couple of roadblocks on how to grow and scale up their portfolios. So, what we like to do is give you confidence as an investor. And that's often built off the back of knowledge and understanding about what needs to happen and how to build and grow your team as well. And as part of building and growing your team, um, there's offense. So it may be someone like a buyer's agent who's helping you buy and accumulate, for example, or your accountant helping you get on the front foot. And there's someone that's helping you get on the back foot, which is what I call a defensive move, uh, if we want to use a few sporting analogies there. And part of that defense is protecting what you have and today I'm joined in the studio by Olivia Southall and Nikki McNamara from Kells Lawyers. Um, I don't want to call you the last line of defense, but I, I'm going to say <laughs> your role is super, super important. Um, and today we're going to talk about wills and estate planning. And this is very much an experience share. And what I mean by that is uh, these are professionals who I've personally used, uh, seen the value of, and I feel like it's a topic that maybe flies under the radar because um, we're going to call for what is. It can be slightly morbid uh, talking about uh, our life and what needs to happen next as well. But um, if you don't prepare and plan for it, then someone else will have to take that place. So that's why I want to have a chat to you both as well. Before we do kick off, I just want to make sure that you understand that this uh, conversation is general in nature, not intended to give advice. And if you do need specific advice, please reach out to your lawyer, your solicitor, or reach out to the team at Kells who are going to be happy to, um, to have a chat with you. Olivia, Nikki, welcome. How are you going? Well, thank you. Good, thank you. Excellent. Uh, we're neighbours as in our neck of the woods, uh, so it's great to have you uh, in the studio with us today uh, talking all things wills and estate planning. But before we kick off, do you want to share a little bit what I call the three Ps about yourself personally, about your own professional journey as well? Uh, and if you want to share a little bit about your property journey or where, you've, where, where you live and a bit about yourself. So... Um, I'm going to look straight at you, Olivia, if you have one to go first. <laughs> sure. Um, I guess a little bit about me. Yep. I've been working at Kells for about five years now, just yep. over five years. Wonderful. Um, started as a law cadet during my studies at the University of Wollongong Lovely. and have been a lawyer for almost three years. I ran our rural office yep. out in that neck of the woods so close to you. Yeah. Um, and I practice primarily across a variety of areas, property, wills and estates, uh, claims on estates and a bit of leasing in there, mm. which keeps me nice and busy. Yeah. Um, which I think you've ticked most of those boxes for us, isn't it? <laughs> leasing, yeah, I think, I think we've done uh, pretty much estate, all of it. Uh, and it's, I mean, it says a lot. It says a lot about yourself and the knowledge that you've built up. I want to say in such a short period of time that you've come out of lots, kind of out of uni and, and almost Straight into it. ducked to water. You've taken to this and, yeah. and you've been great to deal with. Thank you. Yeah, Thank wonderful. you. Um, personally, um, I am renting, so not in the property market at the it's moment. But young. It's yeah. the goal, um, yeah. you know, saving up our hard-earned pennies. Yeah. Um, so we're currently living in Engadine, so just a bit north of um, Thoreau. We just made the move up there. Yeah. Um, work obviously keeps both of us very busy. Me and my partner are both lawyers, so yeah. we're no doubt very busy all the time. Are they... Are they um wonderful conversation on the Friday night talking shop or do you do you make a hard decision that we're not talking shop oh you can't you can't stop it you can't stop it sometimes it's um good to just kind of vent outside of the work space Mm. sometimes and just get a different perspective yeah um but you also got to know when to turn it off and talk about other things yes um but we actually got a a puppy in COVID last year so he keeps us really busy what puppy do we get We've got a 10-month-old golden retriever. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he um, occupies a lot of our time and yeah, energy and is um, needy, <laughs> if you could say. <laughs> Bit of a COVID baby or so, a COVID yeah. puppy. Yeah, so, um, yeah, he keeps us busy. Excellent. Thanks very much. Welcome, Nikki. Thank you. Uh, so a, a little bit about me. I've been working professionally 15 years. Um, yeah. Historically, I started out in taxation. So up in yeah. Sydney working as a taxation solicitor um, yeah. before moving to the Illawarra about 10 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, moving um, down here, being with Kells about five years in the States, um, yeah. estate planning. So yeah. it's something that, yeah, it's been, builds a lot upon taxation, um, but now really specialising in, you know, dealing with, yeah, people and, yeah, putting yeah. in into, yeah. Estate planning in place. Wonderful. Yeah. And family wise, I know you got your hands full. I do, I do. So yes, I have three children, um, three primary age children. So the last one went to primary school this year, which is a bit of an achievement, as I'm sure any parent out there would know. I'm sure. My thought is 
when they get to school, they've actually got less time because school hours are shorter, right? Compared to I my, say my, my three and one year old, you get a little bit more time because of because of daycare. But oh, no, I'm sure you've got like extra curricular <laughs> on top of school as well, right? That, that's right. So yeah, the nine and three comes around very quickly. Mm. So so but yeah, it's uh, no, they certainly keep me busy. Um, but look, the Illawarra is a beautiful, beautiful region, and yeah. um, uh, we live up in West Wollongong, so just in that oh, foothill of Mount Kira, and it's just yeah, we have the most beautiful view of Mount Kira. Oh, so yeah, so it's yeah, a really nice spot. Beautiful. So today I've called it the idiot's guide to <laughs> wills and estate planning because for a lot of the, uh, I, I, and again, I, I, I'm going to say this quite a lot as an experience share. When I have a chat to clients, like, just do the loan. And I'm like, yeah, I'll stay in my lane and do the loan. However, you need to be thinking about your future. Now, it's particularly life-changing events or as you grow and build your wealth, for example. So we'll have a chat about some of those key milestones, particularly where you both come in. But for the uninitiated, let's start with what a will is and what an estate plan is, if I, if I can. So it's going to take you back to probably legal 101 um, <laughs> for yourself, uh, Olivia. But did you want to kind of share kind of where, from your perspective, the basics you know idiot's guide is probably a really good way to introduce <laughs> it um i did like what you said at the start probably around um you know the this area of law and it, it is an unestimated you know area mm-hmm. of law and that people don't necessarily turn their thoughts to it yeah. um you know sometimes it's put in that too hard basket you know you are thinking about you know, your death and then what might happen so people sometimes you know park it to the side and, and don't address it when they should yeah. um so it can be really important to get on the front foot and you know buying property and those type of things is certainly a time where you should really you know make sure you, you do think it out yeah um, you know, estate planning is probably broader than putting in place just a will. Um, you know, you really start looking at, you know, legally, what do you own? You know, what are your assets? Um, you know, property is obviously, you know, one of your big assets. Mm. So, but it can include, you know, money in the bank, um, you know, shares, superannuation, all those type of, you know, assets that you, you might have, um, which ensuring that how you legally own them and yeah. what you'd like to happen with them is, is sort of, uh, you know, thought through and, um, you know, discussed with someone that, that operates in that space. Okay. So once you get an understanding, really, you know, what are your assets? Um, you know, part of the estate plan is then ensuring that, you know, if you were to pass away, you know, wh- where does it go and who are you looking after? So yeah. working out your beneficiaries, who's your executor and, um, you know, where there's minor children involved. Certainly for me, when, when we had those children, is ensuring that, uh, you know, putting in place guardianship arrangements. Um, yeah. If something was to happen to you. Just on that point, I feel like that is, it's a real turning point. And I think that only hit us when we had kids going, oh, right, so what happens now? Um, I'm not speaking uh, out of school. People don't have children. I think it's just a natural evolution that when you get to that stage, you're like, now there's people that rely and depend on me. And if one of us aren't around, what happens in that situation, isn't it? So, yeah, I guess you do come to terms with, okay, now I've got a family, kids to take care of, and putting in some really clear measures and if if we weren't around, what would happen to our kids, isn't it? Yeah, and I think a lot of people spend a lot of, you know, part of their working life generating wealth and, mm. you know, putting a lot of your time goes into building that. Uh, and so putting some forethought and structure into setting it up um, can certainly ensure that all that hard-built wealth actually, you know, can be used in the way that you intended to. Yeah, great. Mm. Perfect. And for yourself, Olivia, uh, when you're talking about a will, for example, what, what's what, when you're talking about you know, the idiot's guide to, yeah. what, is that, what does that capture and what does that look like for yourself? Yeah, mainly it's just helping clients get that peace of mind, you know, making sure that their affairs are in order because, you know, a lot of people come to us when they hear the bad side of it and what happens when you don't have these documents in place and it's, mm. it's almost a bit of a scare tactic sometimes that people come to us driven by that fear of not knowing what's going to happen if they don't have their affairs in order. So it's just, you know, walking them through that process and making sure all their ducks are lined up and, mm. and helping them and get that sorted. Yeah, great. So if I was, again, going through our experience, and um, the experience was wonderful, right? And I'm not saying that to blow any smoke, but just to say <laughs> um, you come out of it going, I'm glad we did it. Yeah. But I can just remember forgot. sitting in the room just going, my head's spinning a little bit, right? And you probably see people, like, I need a minute. Um, yeah. Because let's, let's, we'll go through it. We'll talk about what happens if Bernadette, my wife, pass away? What happens if I pass away? What happens to our business? What happens to our children? What happens if something happens to both of us? Mm-hmm. Who's going to take care of our kids? Uh, and then you start to go, okay, who is next in line yep. um, from a family? And then also having that conversation with family as well. So as part of that, how do you then raise the topic with family or your next of kin, for example, to say, look, we've nominated you. Are you 
are you willing to step up or step in if it wants to happen? Have you been part of those conversations and yeah. guiding that as well? Yeah, look, we talk we talk about all those things in, in conference with clients and, and like what you said, they get quite shocked about thinking, you know, what happens if me and all my family pass away at the same time? Where does things go at that time? And mm. it's not something that anyone really thinks about because you don't want to think about it. Absolutely. Um, but, yeah, we definitely have those conversations in our initial consult with the clients. It's more just a fact-gathering exercise to talk about, you know, what they have, what they want to do, um, and then give them time to go back and, you know, process that, you know, think about what was spoken about. You know, they generally come back and, you know, confirm what they what they want to do before we finalise things. Yeah. But it's during that time that we suggest they talk to the people who they're going to appoint as their executor, talk about who they're going to appoint their power of attorney because no one wants to be surprised when someone dies and then they, they're told they have to do all of this paperwork and things like that. So it's, yeah, just making sure everyone's on board and, and happy to assist really. Mm. So there's a great saying that I've heard and you probably will laugh when I say it in the legal circles, where there's a will, there's family. And I heard that from a, a family lawyer a little while ago. So while you can kind of ingest, say it and, and have a bit of uh, a laugh at it, it can actually be quite a serious matter, right? So uh, especially when you lose a loved one, uh, particularly a parent, for example, now there's the, the state and all the assets that work out. You know, there's family, there's in-laws, there might be stepchildren that are involved in it, now there's grandkids as well. It can get quite complicated. So I guess there's two scenarios, one if there's a will already in place and one if there isn't. So let's talk through both scenarios. I'm happy for whoever, either of you to jump in at one stage. If a loved one, say a parent, uh, passes away and then there is a will in place what happens at that stage take us through who wants to go yeah sure. so look within a will itself <coughs> there's a, an executor role so the executor being the person within your family or you know close friend that uh, you feel is able to take on that role of administering your estate. Yeah. So usually the steps are that the executor will have to uh, have this role of it putting into effect the, the wishes of the deceased. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's things such as, um, you know, working out what are the assets um, that might need to be administered, who are the beneficiaries, and undertaking those legal steps to administer the estate. Mm. Uh, now, and it can get, uh, you know, some families are different, um, and I think it was We're talking just, family and money, right? So yeah, everyone's got really different ways of approaching family and money. Yeah, yeah and look, sometimes, in, particularly within husband and wife, it, it's more straightforward. But when you are going to that next generation and the children, you know, if there's multiple children, yeah. do you pick one child? Do you pick multiple children? Are they going to have the same view on how things might, um, you know, how you would want to administer the estate? You know, yeah. when there's property involved, it, it's things yeah. such as you know, determining the sale price of the property, what would you accept? Um, those type of decisions are <coughs> made by the executor. Yeah. Uh, and, and it can even be more simple things than that. Um, you know, lots of families are very, uh, you know, in terms of how they make decisions easily. Sometimes there's a bit more conflict. Yeah. Um, and I think just before Christmas there was one where the executors couldn't decide on how to bury or cremate um, their loved ones. Yeah. So, and it ended up in court. So you have to be very careful about who you choose as your executor mm -hmm. um, to make sure that they can work together in their decision. Yeah. And then I guess the the lead to that is, would you then say my personal wish is to be cremated? Like, would that then kind of put to bed some of these issues as well, where you, you were then getting specific about what, what are your wishes as opposed to leading up to someone else to decide? Oh, very much so. And uh, I think there was a trend originally to have those wishes in your will. Mm. People started to move away from it. But <laughs> certainly my experience is to have it in the will uh, is certainly very clear on what you want. Um, yeah. I think you do need to let your, your executor and your family know what your wishes are. Uh, sometimes if you haven't had that conversation, to have that clause in the will can give them that, I guess, mm. knowledge that this is what you actually want yeah, okay. and remove some of those potential conflicts. Absolutely. And then let's go to the situation where there isn't an, uh, a will and now it's families that have to make decisions and hard, tough decisions, for example. Have you been part of those conversations? And what have you seen that kind of works well? And what have you seen that doesn't work well and now has to go down probably a legal route as well? Olivia? Yeah, look, it's not as easy as having a will in place. And that's why there's so much focus on, on having them and, and the importance of having them because it's a bit more, I guess, work and a bit more stress for the family to figure out who's going to take that role on and who's going to be that that person for the family to to make those decisions mm. and who's most appropriate really. So, um, yeah, it can be a bit messier, but that's where, you know, they get some really good legal advice and, and help people that can go through that process and figure out what needs to be done. Mm. Excellent. I mean, there's, and we, we've gone to the example that someone who's, is deceased 
but it doesn't have to be necessarily that. It could be um, physically I've got ill, got, got an illness, for example, or maybe a lot, you know, state of mind has changed as well. We're unable to make those decisions. So again, I know again, experience share where that was talked about. Going at what stage do I hand over the reins to someone because I'm unable to make these decisions through either mental or physical illness as well? Is that is that fair? Yeah, that? yeah, and that's where your your powers of attorney and enduring guardian documents come into place and. It, it's always hard to, to sell them really because everyone thinks they're just needed for, you know, your elderly people and things like that. Yeah. But, you know, loss of capacity can come at any time. It can be, you know, you're overseas and you need someone here on the ground to, to do things for you. So it's really mm-hmm. important as part of the estate planning process that we have that overall broad discussion with about with the client about what, what they need to achieve yeah. and having people in place to do all of those jobs at kind of every stage of your life looking after your legal and financial decisions mm. and your health if, if you couldn't do that for yourself. Yeah, well said. I, I know that you, you know, you're super respectful of client confidentiality, for example, so I'm not going to ask for specifics, but have you got a couple of examples where you've seen it done particularly well and it's gone you know, it's gone to plan and it's gone really above board and the family's been super happy and then maybe an example where it hasn't gone and <laughs> maybe it's come off the rails and you, you have a smile on your face. So there's probably uh, multiple examples But just kind of what, so let's go through it. What happened and maybe what could have been included to prevent it going off the rails as well, if you've got an example for us. Um, What do we start with, good or bad? You probably (laughs) probably remember the bad more than the good, probably because it it just is a bit more of a a lasting memory. Yeah. Um, The good ones are quite regular. Um, We get to work with a lot of wonderful people and help them through a really difficult time in their life. So um, some of them are really easy and it's a really step-by-step process, but on the same hand, they can be really difficult. And like you said, families are really different and really complex and everyone's got a different kind of setup. So it's just managing a lot of different people at at different times. um, Probably when you're looking at you know, different family arrangements and, you know, you probably have what you might want to call, um, you know, a vanilla family that, you know, mum, dad, kids. Um, mm. When you start moving into some of the more, you know, modern families, which might include, you know, second marriages or right. all those type of blended arrangements, which can really, from an estate plan, really, uh, I guess, raise different issues, which you need to work through quite carefully. Um, because, again, being on the front foot and putting in place uh, and thinking through, uh, you know, Olivia and I were talking about this before we came in and that where you have these blended families, that's these competing interests that you have. You know, normally there might be a new spouse, there might be children from a prior relationship. Yes. How do you balance those interests together um, in, in, and provide for those people that you want to provide for? Mm. Uh, so probably some of the more complicated estate planning will come from, you know, some of those type of dynamics. Mm. Um, but I also find that even people's assets positions are changing and, you know, it's no longer just the family home and, and the cash in the bank. You might have one or two investment properties. Um, you might Cryptocurrencies have, is a big one. Cryptocurrency, yeah. 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 Um, you know, family trusts, um, self-managed yeah. super fund. Um, Superannuation is a big one because quite often that's one that flies on the radar. When you start your super and you do it kind of earlier in your career and you're nominated, Maybe your current partner at the time as your beneficiary, and then you have a subsequent relationship or marriage, and it's like you haven't updated your super, and that again has become a real sticking point from what I've seen talking to financial planners as well. Mm. Well, and quite often you might have you know former partner, you might have your mum yeah. and dad, um, right. but yeah. you now have a wife and kids. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, and look, as part of that process when we meet with clients, it's uh, you know superannuation is one we always do bring up, and mm. yeah, we're doing your estate plan, we're putting in place a will, um, but really this is an opportunity to check your superannuation nominations. Um, you know, what do you have and what do you want to happen? Yeah. It's what I call pulling a piece of string because you start originally yeah. here, and it's like it can start to, you and you can you can understand for a lot of people like oh like. I just came here to get what a simple will done. Yeah. Like, I've got Australia Post and, you know, there's dodgy will kits, for example, um, and we call them dodgy, but, I mean, <laughs> exactly that, right? I mean, you, it's intention. You, you want to do it right, but I'm like, if you're going to do it right, go to a professional and get it done properly so it's documented mm-hmm. uh, as well. And you just touched on it from an asset perspective. Wills and estate plans often seen that was kind of maybe for the upper echelon or people that had a lot of estates, but you're right, the amount of that clients that, that are at asset rich, like they've got an investment property, they've got a good super balance, they've got good cash in the bank, they've got shares, for example. We're not talking about the elite, we're talking about very much normal Australian families that have accumulated a fair amount of wealth as well. Yeah, what's 
Interesting, and I think with, uh, you know, we always encourage people with wills, powers of attorney and guardianship. Um, people might come in and go, oh, well, I don't want the government to get my money. Uh, mm. And it's it, it's probably a misconception that if you don't have a will, the government will get your money. Um, yeah. As much as the New South Wales government would love it, I'm sure. But, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, there are laws of intestacy, which effectively do have, a, I guess, a statutory uh, hierarchy on, on where your estate would go if you, if you don't have a will in place. Yeah. Um, but that that's, I just want to stop you there because that's, I mean, that's one of those legal words that just rolls off your tongue. But mm. for the uninitiated going, what does that mean? Yeah, so intestacy is uh, effectively the, the laws which govern if you do not have a will in place and you die, what happens to your assets? Right. And the it's enshrined within legislation or yeah. within the law itself. Um, and, you know, a, a lot, depending on your family um, and depending on your assets, again, a lot can depend on your circumstances, but it'll include, for example, you know, y- your wife or, or your husband. It could yeah. include your children. Uh, it could include a split if there's, you know, you know children from prior relationships. So yeah, okay. the government in there, but the, the very, very bottom, um, I guess, of, of, of that pyramid in terms of who might receive your assets. Yeah, okay. Yeah, great. Uh, and then the how do people have this discussion with family? Have you guys seen this done very well where you go, look, how do you bring this up with your family to say, look, I've nominated you as my executive, I've nominated you as, as this person to take care of my family. How do you, how do you bring that up? And it can be a really awkward conversation for, for family. Uh, I, I think... In my experience, it's been you, you go see a solicitor, they ask you questions probably that you weren't particularly expecting and there's a lot more involved in it than you might realise. Mm. Um, but at the end of it, it's it's not as difficult as what people thought that sometimes the hardest part is just having the phone call and making your appointment and then, yeah. you know, we really take it from there in terms of, you know, asking the questions that are needed. Um, but there's always homework that we give you. Um, you know, we need you to go and look up your super nominations. We need to make sure that you've spoken with your executors and they're happy to take on the role. Yeah. Um, but I, in terms of being, um, I guess, open and transparent with your family, uh, I think that can ensure that, you know, it, it stops problems arising because you've been open and transparent at the outset. Yeah. So it doesn't work for everybody. Um, not everyone's circumstances want to be, um, you know, have those conversations, but we would encourage Certainly to have them, yes. Yeah, because if you're not making those decisions, someone else is now going to make those decisions for you and they they may not be the decisions that you wanted to be made as well. I think that's where we're saying if you can take that control back, that at least you've done your part to your family as well, Mm -hmm. yeah? I I talk about different, I guess, life moments and triggers as well. So from your experience, again, calling your experience here, what are some of those milestones that happen in life when you go, okay, this is when you should be updating? So let's assume that someone's got a will, mm-hmm. estate plan set up, but then keep updating it. What are some of those milestones that then would then hey, pick up the phone and, and make sure that this is updated as well? Sure, there's there's definitely a few that you should think about. Yeah. Um, first one is probably buying property. Owning property is probably one of the biggest assets you'll you'll ever have. So it's really important that mm-hmm. you review your will or update it and ensure that how you own that property is reflective of, of what those wishes are in the will. Yeah. People need to understand how the ownership can affect um, your will. Yeah. Um, you know, people can't give something that you own something jointly with other other people. Mm-hmm. So it could have really differing effects in the long run. Yeah. Um, the other one is probably children. <laughs> yeah, okay. Big one to think about making wills and like you touched on before, making sure you've got appropriate mm. things in place. Um, some other key ones are marriage, divorce, um, really key times and when you should update your will and that's when we work with our family law team here at Kells to ensure those clients are, are being looked after because there's some actual things um, involved in the legislation that has implications on your will. So not many people know if, if you have a will and then you get married, that marriage actually cancels the will you had unless you effectively dealt with it in the will to say you were going to be married and you didn't want that to happen. Right. So that means if you die, then that will is void and you've died intestate and, and wow. effectively died without a will whilst you have one. So that's really an important consideration for people to think about. Yeah. Uh, similarly with divorce, it's always a good time to maybe take someone out or, or reassess what you wanted to do. Mm. Um, lastly, probably assets, you know, change in assets, have money, lose money, really important time to think about what, what implication that can have on your will. Yeah, okay. And peace of Mickey. 
Mm. Anything you want to add on that? Yeah, probably the only thing I, I might add, um, if there's a, a death of one of your executors, mm. your beneficiaries, um, um, just yeah. ensuring that where you've nominated a person within your will, um, we do draft wills. So we do, we call them substitution in that if something happens in this scenario, you know, the mm. next the next cause will take effect, which, for example, my executor no longer can take on the role. Is there a substituted executor? Spot on. Yeah. Um, so I think in that situation, if I can relate to that, give you an example. So if something happened to Bernadette and I, I think we nominated Bernie's parents. Mm-hmm. Now, if they're at a stage where they're a bit older and they physically can't physically can't take care of our, our daughters, then who steps in? And I was like, oh, great. So we got to that stage. And then it's like, but well, what if scenario? Okay, great. That might be my brother. Okay, if my brother's not around or he's unable to, then what happens at that stage? And you're like, ah, oh, okay, so we're not just solved one problem, but we're kind of two or three steps ahead as yeah. well, isn't it? And it's, it forces you to think and then again have these conversations with people and go, what happens in their life if something changes and they're unable to, to now take care of you know, either the state or family, for example, as well? Yeah, it's, a bit, it's about future-proofing, really. We want clients to consider every possible scenario whilst it's not nice to think about. Mm. We want to help you create a will that is going to survive potentially a lot of different significant life events that may happen. While she said she'll review it every now and then and every couple of years, we still want to put measures in place that addresses possible scenarios so that you're not updating it every year or, yeah. or all the time because that can be quite costly and quite a timely exercise as yeah, well. Yeah, spot on. You often hear, you only hear the bad stories, you know, from a lending perspective. You hear the bad stories in the media sometimes. And again, family law, you hear the bad stories where someone's been taken to court or the children have taken a parent to court over a, you know, a will or trying to contest it. Does it get to that stage or does it go through, you know, rounds before it gets in court, for example? Because I can understand that would be quite an expensive way to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Are there the measures in place to go, right, round one is this, round two is this before it actually has a and stay in court. Okay. Yeah, look, as soon as you mention court proceedings, you know, you're thinking cost, you're thinking time, you're thinking stress, um, yeah. not something that you want to be involved in if you really don't have to be. Yeah. Um, claims on estates are probably becoming much more prevalent. I guess it's just an awareness about it now, but also yeah. people are putting different measures in place that don't um, fulfil uh, people's needs when when they pass away. So right. there are there are measures in place, and, and we at Kells, when we handle these kinds of matters, we try to negotiate and mediate where possible and keep things out of court. Um, mm. But it's inevitable that sometimes they do get there. Right. Um, but thankfully, in in the legislation and in the area of claims, um, the first step after you file a claim is to always go to some type of mediation or informal settlement conference. The court wants the parties to have every opportunity to resolve it between themselves before it gets to their yeah. their decision making. Really, so um, gives gives everyone the opportunity to to sort it out themselves yeah. without incurring those costs and leaving it in someone else's hands. Yeah, nice. Yeah, perfect. Uh, like I said, this is a conversation that has to be had. Uh, not everyone loves it, but there's a reason why you both and Kells exists. For example, when putting out the terms, this exists. It's to make this accessible, it's to make this documented, above board, uh, and avoid any future issues that come up. So um, I want to say thank you both very much um, for sharing your knowledge. And I'm sure there's so much more knowledge that sits in your head. So when someone's, you know, a client's in front of you, this is something that will just come naturally to you. And that this is what you need to do. We're two or three steps ahead of you. you know, you've done this multiple times before. So anyone that has that, I guess, that fear or that intimidation about getting the ball rolling on this, it's like, well, actually, this is a very normal client experience. And There's not much we haven't seen. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's, that, that's great from an experience perspective because yeah, you can build it up in your head and having gone through it, I'm like, I'm just glad we did that. Mm. Glad we did it. Now it's a matter of updating or tweaking as, as we go along as well, but just knowing that you're getting your house in order is the most important thing, I think. Yeah. Put to, put to the side uh, the morbid or you know, the fact that you, you know, we're on this earth for a certain time, but it's in what you do with it and how you leave it to your family. That's the most important part as well. And I really appreciate Definitely. you both coming in, appreciate your, your time and your insights as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if you found that helpful, uh, we're going to include the details for Olivia and Nikki and the team at Kells to reach out. Again, I call it an experience share because I've, uh, I've personally – uh, had skin in the game where I've uh, dealt with Olivia and it was it was easy as an experience. Um, definitely going through it, you you think about your own life. Um, 
But then you realise this is not just about me, it's about my family as well. And that's where you put to bed any any of your own personal, um, I guess, your own personal prejudices about the whole process. And, you know, this is, this is important to do. So thank you both very much. Really appreciate it. And, um, and if you found that helpful, please leave us a review or drop us a line and tell us if there's any questions you've got. We'd love to help you out as well. That's another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron, Christy David, and we'll chat to you next time. Thanks very much.